Hey, how's it going, you fiends? I'm Demi Bulbemi. And I'm Dead Inside. And welcome back to another episode of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Wow. We're almost done. We're halfway. Wow. I mean, like, uh, like tech. The technically and really we're halfway we're at part two wow that was fast i guess it is like a small book yeah give us a recap last time raul duke was escaping las vegas he lost his shit he thought everyone was out to get him he thought the mint hotel was gonna get him the fbi was gonna get him highway patrol that hitchhiker kid and then he got to baker california called his attorney and his attorney's like you're an idiot. Go back to Las Vegas. And then he said, oh, yeah. Let's go to Las Vegas. And then that's where we are. Oh, yeah. I had a telegram. <laughs> so it's weird. This part two it starts back over at, like, chapter one. Oh, that's wild. So it's part two, chapter one. It's going to almost be split into, like, two books. That'd oh, my be, God. What a cliffhanger. <laughs> About 20 miles east of Baker, I stopped to check the drug bag. The sun was hot, and I felt like killing something. Anything. Even a big lizard. Drill the fucker. I got my attorney's three fifty seven Magnum out of the trunk and spun the cylinder. It was loaded all the way around. Long, nasty little slugs. 158 grains with a fine, flat trajectory and painted Aztec gold on the tips. I blew the horn a few times, hoping to call up an iguana. Get the buggers moving. They were out there. I knew. In that goddamn sea of cactus, hunkered down, barely breathing, and every one of the stinking little bastards was loaded with deadly poison. Iguanas? <laughs> that maybe, fuck, I don't know. I don't think Some iguanas... Sort of desert lizard? Well, not maybe familiar. other lizards, not fucking iguanas. <laughs> He's just talking about reptiles in general, I don't know. He's, he has a weird thing about reptiles. Because all, all he has ma- made reference to is just lizards. Is that a big lizard? Mm-hmm. Who knows? And an iguana. Three fast explosions knocked me off balance. Three deafening double action blasts from the 357 in my right hand. Jesus! Firing at nothing for no reason at all. Bad craziness. I tossed the gun into the front seat of the shark and stared nervously at the highway. No cars either way. The road was empty for two or three miles in both directions fine luck it would not do to be found in the desert under these circumstances firing wildly into the cactus from a car full of drugs and especially not now on the lamb from the highway patrol awkward questions would arise well now mister uh duke do you understand of course that it is illegal to discharge a firearm of any kind while standing on a federal highway what Even in self-defense, this goddamn gun has a hair trigger, officer. The truth is, I only meant to fire once. Just to scare the little bastards. A heavy stare, then speaking very slowly. Are you saying, Mr. Duke, that you were attacked out here? Well, no. Not literally attacked, officer, but seriously menaced. I stopped to piss, and the minute I stepped out of the car, these filthy little bags of poison were all around me. They moved like greased lightning. Would this story hold up? No. They would place me under arrest, then routinely search the car, and when that happened, all kinds of savage hell would break loose. They would never believe all these drugs were necessary to my work, that in truth I was a professional journalist on my way to Las Vegas to cover the National District Attorney's Conference on Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. (laughs) Just samples, officer. I got this stuff off a roadman for the Neo-American Church back in Barstow. He started acting funny, so I worked him over. Would they buy this? No. They would lock me in some hellhole of a jail and beat me on the kidneys with big branches, causing me to piss blood for years to come. He has, like, a wild idea of, like, what goes on. Maybe that did happen in the 70s, but fuck. That's, he's a crazy person. He's on drugs. He doesn't know what's happening. Luckily, nobody bothered me while I ran a quick inventory on the kit bag. The stash was a hopeless mess, all churned together and half-crushed. Some of the mescaline pellets had disintegrated into a reddish-brown powder, but I counted about 30 or 40 still intact. 35 or 40 still intact. My attorney had eaten all the reds, but there are quite a bit of speed left. No more grass. The Coke bottle was empty. One acid blotter, a nice brown lump of opium hash, and six loose amyls. Not enough for anything serious, but a careful rationing of the mescaline 
would probably get us through the four day drug conference. On the why are they okay? Like I get like drugs is like their thing, but I just maybe I'm just too cautious. But I'm like, why would you go to a drug conference with a billion police on drugs? Shit, why not? I mean, why not? What a savage journey that would be. On the outskirts of Vegas, I stopped at a neighborhood pharmacy and bought two quarts of gold tequila, two fifths of Ch- Chivas Regal, and a pint of ether. You could just buy ether back then? I mean, I guess. I was tempted to ask for some amyls. My angina pectoris was starting to act up, but the druggist had the eyes of a mean Baptist hysteric. I told him I needed the ether to get the tape off my legs, but by that time he'd already rung the stuff up and bagged it. He didn't give a fuck about ether. I wonder what he would say if I asked him for $22 worth of Romolar and a tank of nitrous oxide. Probably he would have sold it to me. Why not? Free enterprise. Give the public what it needs, especially this bad, sweaty, nervous, talking fella with tape all over his legs and this terrible cough, along with angina, pectoris, and these god-awful aneuristic flashes every time he gets in the sun. I mean, this fellow was in bad shape, officer. How the hell was I to know he'd walk straight out to his car and start abusing those drugs? How indeed. I lingered a moment at the magazine rack, then got a grip on myself and hurried outside to the car. The idea of going completely crazy on laughing gas in the middle of a DA's drug conference had a definite warped appeal. (laughs) But not on the first day, I thought. Save that for later. No point in getting busted and committed before the conference even starts. I stole a review journal from a rack in the parking lot. But I threw it away after reading a story on page one. Surgery uncertain after eyes removed. Baltimore, UPI. Doctor said Friday that they were uncertain whether surgery would succeed in restoring the eyesight of a young man who pulled out his eyes while suffering the effects of a drug overdose in a jail cell. Charles Eines Jr., 25, underwent surgery late Thursday at Maryland General Hospital, but doctor said it may be weeks before they could determine the outcome. A statement issued by the hospital reported that Eines had no light perception in either eye prior to surgery and the possibility he will ever have light perception is extremely poor. Eines, son of a prominent Massachusetts Republican, was found in a jail cell Thursday by a turnkey who said Eines had pulled out his eyeballs. A turnkey? Turnkey? By a turnkey? Probably like, um... Like someone who like turns the key to like unlock the cells, like a guard or something. Probably. I read it as turnkey at (laughs) first. Like a turkey. Like a turkey. (laughs) Eines was arrested Wednesday night while walking nude through a neighborhood near where he lived. He was examined at Mercy Hospital and then placed in a jail cell. Police and one of the Eines friends said he had taken an overdose of animal tranquilizer. Jesus. Police reported the drug was PCP. A Park Davis product not sold for human medical purposes since 1963. However, a spokesman for Park Davis said he thought the drug might be ab- might be available on the black market. Taken alone, the spokesman said PCP effects would not last more than 12 to 14 hours. However, the effects of PCP combined with an hallucinogen known such as LSD were not known. Eines told a neighbor last Saturday, the day after he first took the drug, that his eyes were bothering him and that he could not read. Wednesday night, police said Ayn seemed to be in a deeply depressed state and so impervious to pain that he did not scream when he pulled his, out his eyes. PCP is one hell of a drug. Like, I remember hearing a thing about somebody took PCP or was on PCP and just fucking dunked their hand into a deep fryer. I've heard uh, stories of people doing PCP, whether it's true or not. I've heard stories of people like breaking their legs and being able to run from police because like... They, they can't feel the they pain can't of their feel legs it. being broken. Like, what damage that would fucking cause. Like, I heard, was it, I think it's PCP that I heard gives you almost, like, superhuman, like, strength as well. I think because you can't feel pain. So, like, you don't know can't that you're... Feel your muscles like, shredding. Yeah, like, people have been, I think, from what I understand, like, known to, like, scale fucking walls and shit. Like, because they can't feel, like, their fingernails, like, ripping out of their fingers and... They just would like, like, fucking just like, climb up a wall like a like a fucking creature. I just imagine like you know like after a day of like a night of hard drinking and then you wake <laughs> up and you have like crazy bruises on your leg, and you're like, ow. Wow. Ow. Where did I get those? <laughs> I just imagine like a night of PCP or I don't know how long PCP lasts. It like where you're 
climbing shit and like your nails were being ripped off of your fingertips and you have like all these scratches and you've like over exerted all of your muscles to wake up from that. Both your legs are broken. So much agonizing pain. I'd be like, give me more PCP. Fuck. Just to stop the pain. Damn. That's fucking rough. <clears throat> Chapter two. Another day, another convertible, and another hotel full of cops. The first order of business was to get rid of the Red Shark. It was too obvious. Too many people might recognize it, especially the Vegas police. Although, as far as they knew, the thing was already back home in L.A. It was last thing running at top speed across Death Valley on Interstate 15, stopped and warned in Baker by the CHP, then suddenly disappeared. The last place I would look for it, I felt, was in a rental car lot at the airport. I had to go out there anyway to meet my attorney. He would be arriving from L.A. in the late afternoon. I drove very quietly on the freeway, gripping my normal instinct for bursts of acceleration and sudden lane changes, trying to remain inconspicuous. And when I got there, I parked the shark between two old Air Force buses and in, or in a utility lot about half a mile from the terminal. Very tall buses. Make it hard as possible for the fuckers. A little walking never hurt anybody. By the time I got to the terminal, I was pouring sweat, but nothing abnormal. I tend to sweat heavily in warm climates. My clothes are soaking wet from dawn till dusk. This worried me at first, but when I went to a doctor and described my normal daily intake of booze, drugs, and poison, he told me to come back when the sweating stopped. That would be the danger point, he said, a sign that my body's desperately overworked flushing mechanism had broken down completely. I have great faith in the natural processes, he said. But in your case, well, I find no precedent. We'll just have to wait and see, then work with what's left. That can't be real. <laughs> A doctor could have never said that. It's possible. I spent about two hours in the bar drinking Bloody Marys for the V8 nutritional content and watching the flights <laughs> <Me>. from L.A. <laughs> I'd eaten nothing but grapefruit for about 20 hours and my head was adrift from its moorings. You better watch yourself, I thought. There are limits to what the human body can endure. You don't want to break down and start bleeding from the ears right here in the terminal. Not in this town. In Las Vegas, they kill the weak and deranged. <laughs> I realized this and kept quiet when I felt symptoms of a terminal blood sweat coming on. But this passed. I saw the cocktail waitress getting nervous, so I forced myself to get up and walk stiffly out of the bar. No sighing of my attorney. Down to the VIP car rental booth where I traded the Red Shark in for a white Cadillac convertible. This goddamn Chevy has caused me a lot of trouble, I told them. I get the feeling that people are putting me down, especially in gas stations, when I have to get out and open the hood manually. Well, of course, said the man behind the desk. What you need, I think, is one of our Mercedes 600 town cruiser specials with air conditioning. You can even carry your own fuel if you want. We make that available. No, or... Do I look like a goddamn Nazi? I said. I have a natural American car. Nothing at all. Fucking chill out. They called up the white Coupe de Ville at once. Everything was automatic. I could sit in the red leather driver's seat and make every inch of the car jump by touching the proper buttons. It was a wonderful machine. Ten grand worth of gimmicks and high-priced special effects. The rear windows leaped up with a touch like frogs in a dynamite pond. The white canvas top ran up and down like a roller coaster. The dashboard was full of esoteric lights and dials and meters that I would never understand. <laughs> but there was no doubt in my mind I, I was like into that. a superior machine. There's like a ink blotches on the page. That's so fun. it's like a little hard to read. I like how he describes the car as being like otherworldly almost. Yep. The caddy wouldn't get off the line quite as fast as a red shark but once it got rolling around 80 it was pure smooth hell at that elegant upholstered weight lashing across a desert like rolling through midnight on the old california zephyr i handled the whole transaction with the credit card that i later later learned was canceled completely bogus but the big computer hadn't mixed me yet or hadn't mixed me yet so it was still a fat gold credit risk Oh, my God. Later, looking back on this transaction, I knew the conver conversation that had almost entirely or certainly ensued. Hello. 
This is a VIP car rentals in Las Vegas. We're calling to check on number 875-045-616B. Just a routine credit check, nothing urgent. Long pause at the other end, then... Holy shit! What? Pardon me. Yes, we have that number. It's been placed on emergency redline status. Call the police at once and don't let them out of your sight. Another long pause. Well, uh, you see that number is not on our current red list and, uh, number 875045616B just left our lot in a new Cadillac convertible. No! Yes, he's long gone. Totally insured. Where? I think he said St. Louis. Yes, that's what the card says. Raul Duke, left fielder and batting champion of the St. Louis Browns. Five days at $25 per plus 25 cents a mile. His card was valid, so of course he, we had no choice. This is true. The car rental agency had no legal reason to hassle me since my card was technically valid. During the next four days, I drove that car all over Va Las Vegas, even passing the VIP agency's main office on Paradise Boulevard several times, and at no time was I bothered by any show of rudeness. This is one of the hallmarks of Vegas hospitality. The only bedrock rule is don't burn the locals. Beyond that, nobody cares. They would rather not know. If Charlie Manson checked into the Sahara tomorrow morning, nobody would hassle him as long as he tipped big. Oof. I drove straight to the hotel after renting the car. There was still no sign of my attorney, so I decided to check in on my own. If only to get off the street and avoid a public breakdown. I left the whale in a VIP parking slot. That's interesting. Parking slot and shambled self-consciously into the lobby with one small leather bag, a handcrafted, custom-built satchel that had, just, that had just been made for me by a leathersmith friend in Boulder. Our room was at the Flamingo in the nerve center of the Strip, right across the street from Caesar's Palace and the Dunes, site of the drug conference. The bulk of the comfries were staying at the Dunes, but those of us who signed up fashionably late were assigned to the Flamingo, the place was full of cops. I saw this at a glance. Most of them were just standing around trying to look casual, all dressed exactly alike in their cut-rate Vegas casuals, <laughs> plaid Bermuda shorts, Annie Palmer golf shirts, or Arnie Palmer golf shirts, and hairless white legs tapering down to rubberized beach sandals. It was a terrifying scene to walk into, a super stakeout of some kind. If I hadn't known about the conference, my mind would have snapped. You got the impression that somebody was going to be gunned down in a blazing crossfire at any moment. Maybe the entire Manson family. My arrival was badly timed. Most of the national DAs and other cop types had already checked in. These were the people who now stood around the lobby and stared grimly at newcomers. What appeared to be the final stakeout was only about 200 vacationing cops. With nothing better to do, they didn't even notice each other. I waited up to the desk and got in line. The man in front of me was a police chief from small from some small town in Michigan. His Agnew-style wife was standing about three feet off to his right while he argued with the desk clerk. Look, fella, I told you I have a postcard here that says I have reservations in this hotel. Hell, I'm with the district attorney's conference. I've already paid for my room. Sorry, sir, you're on the late list. Your reservations were transferred to the... Ah... Uh, Moonlight Motel, which is out on Paradise Boulevard, and actually a very fine place of lodging, and only 16 blocks from here, with its own pool. And, you dirty little faggot, call the manager! I'm tired of listening to this dog shit! The manager appeared, and offered to call a cab. This was obviously the second, or maybe even the third act, in a cruel drama that had begun long before I showed up. The police chief's wife was crying. The gaggle of friends that he'd mustered for support were too embarrassed to back him up even now in the showdown at the desk, with this angry little cop firing his best and final shot. They knew he was beaten. He was going against the rules, and the people hired to enforce those rules said, no vacancy. How? That's so aggressive. Like, like he, ha they have another reservation for him. It's not like he doesn't have anywhere to stay. Yeah, I mean, they didn't have to get him another reservation. No. Like, he has somewhere, like... They got him a place, and then also, like, he broke the rule. Never burn the locals. Yeah. <sighs> so now he was just giving their argument back to them. It doesn't matter who's right or wrong, man. Or who's paid his bill and who hasn't. What matters right now is for the first time in my life, I can work out on a pig. Fuck you, officer. I'm in charge here. And I'm telling you, we don't have room for you. 
I was enjoying this whip song, but after a while I felt dizzy, bad, nervous, and my impatience got the better of my amusement, so I stepped around the pig and spoke directly to the desk clerk. Say, I said, I hate to interrupt, but I have a reservation and I wonder if maybe I could just sort of slide through and get out of your way. I smiled, letting him know I'd been digging his snake bully act on the cop party that was now standing there, psychologically off balance and staring at me like I was some kind of water rat crawling up to the desk. I looked pretty bad, wearing old Levi's and white Chuck Taylor all-star basketball sneakers, and my 10 peso Alcapoco short shirt had long since come apart at the shoulder seams from all that road wind. Oh my god. My beard was about three days old, bordering on standard wino trim, and my eyes were totally hidden by Sandy Bull's Saigon mirror shades. But my voice had the tone of a man who knows he has a reservation. I was gambling on my attorney's foresight, but I couldn't pass a chance to put the horn into a cop. And I was right. The reservation was in my attorney's name. The desk clerk hit his bell to summon the bag boy. This is all I have with me right now, I said. The rest is out there in that white Cadillac convertible. I pointed to the car that we could all see parked just outside the front door. Can you have somebody drive it around the room? Or drive it around to the room? The desk clerk was friendly. Don't worry about a thing, sir. Just enjoy your stay here. And if there's anything you need... Just call the desk. I nodded and smiled, half watching the stunned reaction of the cop crowd right next to me. They were stupid with shock. Here, they were arguing with every piece of leverage they could command for a room they'd already paid for. And suddenly, their whole act gets sideswiped by some crusty drifter (laughs) who looks like something out of an upper Michigan hobo jungle. And he checks in with a handful of credit cards. Jesus, what's happening in this world? I think it's funny because it's like, if you're just... Like, nice. You know? Like, if you're just polite and you're a pleasant person. Compliant. Yeah. you Like, people are more likely to give you what you want. Like, obviously in this situation. a little bit of smooth talk and never hurt. Yeah. like honey voice. Because, like, obviously in this situation, like, they might not have, like, any room. Like, maybe the person. Like, there's someone in the room that they had for him. But, like, they're more likely to, like try to like accommodate you as much as they can if you're nice if you're calling people the f word and with a hard t with a hard t and then saying this is dog shit like you're not gonna get making a scene yeah making a fucking scene i would insulting people yeah i've worked in a lot of customer service and i would just be like okay like if you're gonna treat me like shit i'm gonna treat you like shit like i'm not gonna give you what you want or you're like one second let me go let me go see if I can work on that. And then you just go stand in the break room for like 20 minutes and bullshit about how this person's a piece of shit. And you come back out and be like, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. I have I've talked to my manager. <laughs> I have to say I've done that before. Yeah. Like customer customers don't realize that if you're not nice, then you're not going to get help. That's why I don't know if you notice me, but like I'm the fakest person when we deal with like something's wrong Mm. with like something i purchased or something like i am the fakest person like i'm like oh my god i'm so sorry to bug like because i know i know you just gotta fucking butter them up you gotta butter them buns Oof. chapter three savage lucy teeth like baseballs eyes like jellied fire that i don't even understand that i don't teeth like baseballs like there's a dull or they're big and white Big, Maybe round, what? and white. I don't know. <laughs> I gave my bag to the boy who scurried up and told him to bring a quart of wild turkey and two-fifths of Bacardi Anejo with a night's worth of ice. Our room was in one of the farthest wings of the Flamingo. The place is far more than a hotel. It is sort of a huge underfinanced playboy club in the middle of the desert, something like nine separate wings with interconnecting causeways and pools, a vast complex sliced up by a maze of car ramps and driveways, It took me about 20 minutes to wander from the desk to the distant wing we'd been assigned to. My idea was to get into the room, accept the booze and baggage delivery, then smoke my last big chunk of Singapore Grey while watching Walker or Walter Cronkite and waiting for my attorney to arrive. I needed this break, this moment of peace and refuge before we did the drug conference. It was going to be quite a different thing from the Mint 400. That had been an observer gig, but this one would need participation and a very special stance. At the Mint 400, we were dealing with an essentially simpatico crowd. And if our behavior was gross and outrageous, well, it was only a matter of degree. 
But this time, our very presence would be an outrage. We would be attending the conference under false pretenses and dealing from the start with a crowd that was convened for the stated purpose of putting people like us in jail. We wore the menace, not in disguise, but stone obvious drug abusers with the flagrantly cranked up attitude that we intended to push all the way to the limit. Oh my God. Not to prove any final sociological point and not even a conscious mockery. It was mainly a matter of lifestyle, a sense of obligation and even duty. If the pigs were gathering in Vegas for a top level drug drug conference, we felt the drug culture should be represented. Beyond that, I'd been out of my head for so long now that a gig like this seemed perfectly logical. Considering the circumstances, I felt totally meshed with my karma. (sighs) Wrong. (laughs) Or at least I was feeling this way until I got to the big gray door that opened into mini suite 1150 in the far wing. I rammed the key into the knob lock and swung the door open, thinking, ah, home at last. But the door hit something, when I recognized, which I recognized at once as a human form, a girl of undeterminate age with the face and form of a pit bull. She was wearing a shapeless blue smock, and her eyes were angry. Somehow, I knew that I had the right room. I wanted to think otherwise, but the vibes were hopelessly right. And she seemed to know, too, because she made no move to stop me when I moved past her and into the suite. I tossed my leather satchel on one of the, on one of the beds and looked around for what I knew I would see. My attorney, stark naked, standing in the bathroom door with a drug-addled grin on his face. You degenerate pig, I muttered. It can't be helped, he said, nodding at the bulldog girl. This is Lucy, he laughed distractedly. You know, like, Lucy in the sky with diamonds? I nodded to Lucy, who was eyeing me with definite venom. I was clearly some kind of enemy, some ugly intrusion on her scene, and it was clear from the way she moved around the room, very quick, intense on her feet, that she was sizing me up. She was ready for violence. There was not much doubt about that. Even my attorney already picked up on it. Lucy, he snapped. Lucy, be cool, goddammit. Remember what happened at the airport. No more of that, okay? He smiled nervously at her. She had the look of a beast that had just been tossed into a sawdust pit to fight for its life. Lucy, this is my client. This is Mr. Duke, the famous journalist. He's paying for this suite, Lucy. He's on our side. She said nothing. I could see that she was not entirely in control of herself. Huge, huge shoulders on the woman and a chin like Oscar Bonavina. I sat down on the bed and casually reached into my satchel for the mace can. And when I felt my tum on the shoot button tum maybe maybe it meant thumb i don't know on the shoot button i was tempted to jerk the thing out and soak her down on general principles i desperately needed peace rest sanctuary the last thing i wanted was to fight to the finish in my own hotel room with some kind of drug crazed hormone monster my attorney seemed to understand this he knew why my hand was in the satchel no he shouted not here We'll have to move out. I shrugged. He was twisted. I could see that. And so was Lucy. Her eyes were feverish and crazy. She was staring at me like I was something that would have to be rendered helpless before life could get back to whatever she considered normal. My attorney idled over and put his arm around her shoulders. Mr. Duke is my friend, he said gently. He loves artists. Let's show him your paintings. For the first time, I noticed the room was full of artwork. Maybe 40 or 50 portraits, some in oil, some charcoal, all more or less the same size and all the same face. They were propped up on every flat surface. The face was vaguely familiar, but I couldn't get a fix on it. It was a girl with a broad mouth, a big nose, and extremely glittering eyes. A demonically sensual face. The kind of overstated, embarrassingly dramatic renderings that you find in bedrooms of young female art students who get hung up on horses. She looks like a girl that likes books and horses. Oof. (laughs) Lucy paints portraits of Barbara Streisand, my attorney explained. She's an artist up in Montana, he turned to the girl. What's that town where you live? She stared at him, then at me, then back at my attorney again, then finally said, Kalispell, way up north. I drew these from TV. Here's some imagery of the fucking pigs. Oh my god. Oh my god. All their fucking Bermuda shorts. 
in their sandals with socks. Ew. And they just all have like the same haircut and look the same. I fucking hate it. My attorney nodded eagerly. Fantastic, he said. She came all the way down here just to give all these portraits to Barbara. We're going over to the Americana Hotel tonight and meet her backstage. Lucy smiled bashfully. There was no more hostility in her. I dropped the mace can and stood up. We obviously had a serious case on our hands. I hadn't counted on this. Finding my attorney whacked on acid and locked into some kind of preternatural courtship. I don't know. Preternatural? I don't know. Stop. Show me. Show me the money. Well, I said, I guess they brought the car around by now. Let's get the stuff out of the trunk. He nodded eagerly. Absolutely. Let's get the stuff. He smiled at Lucy. We'll be right back. Don't answer the phone if it rings. She grinned and made the one finger Jesus freak sign. God bless, she said. My attorney. What the fuck is a one finger Jesus freak sign? I don't know. Does he mean like the. No. I think it's just like something like that. I don't know. I've, I've never seen anyone do anything with one finger that has to do with Google Jesus. Google one finger Jesus freak sign. So it's literally just like. Just God bless. All just, right. Whatever, dude. My attorney pulled on a pair of elephant leg pants and a glazed black shirt. And then we hurried out of the room. I could see he was having trouble getting oriented. But I refused to humor him. Well, I said, what are your plans? Plans? We were waiting for the elevator. Lucy, I said. He shook his head, struggling to focus on the question. Shit, he said finally. I met her on the plane, and I had all that acid, he shrugged. You know, those little blue barrels? Jesus, she's a religious freak. She's running away from home for something like the fifth time in six months. It's terrible. I gave her that cat before I realized, shit, she's never even had a drink. Well, I said, it'll probably work out. We can keep her loaded and peddle her ass at the drug convention. He stared at me. She's perfect for this gig, I said. These cops will go 50 bucks ahead to beat her into submission and then gang fuck her. What? <laughs> we can set her up in one of those backstreet motels, hang pictures of Jesus all over the room, then turn these pigs loose on her. Hell, she's strong. She'll hold her own. I don't like that. That makes me very uncomfortable. His face was twitching badly. We were in the elevator now, descending into the lobby. Jesus Christ, he muttered. I knew you were sick, but I never expected to hear you actually say that kind of stuff. He seemed stunned. I laughed. It's straight economics. This girl is a godsend. I fixed him with a natural Bogart smile. All teeth. Or Bogart smile. All teeth. Shit, we're almost broke. And suddenly you pick up some muscle-bound loony who can make us a grand a day? No, he shouted. Stop talking like that. The elevator door opened and we walked toward the parking lot. I figured she could do about four at a time, I said. Christ, if we keep her full of acid, that's more like two grand a day. Maybe three. You filthy bastard, he sputtered. I should cave your fucking head in. He was squinting at me, shielding his eyes from the sun. I spotted the whale about 50 feet from the door. There it is, I said. Not a bad looking car for a pimp. He groaned. His face reflected the struggle that I knew he was having in his brain with sporadic acid rushes. Bad waves of painful intensity followed by total confusion. When I opened the trunk of the whale to get the bags, he got angry. What the hell are you doing, he snapped. This isn't Lucy's car. I know, I said. It's mine. This is my luggage. The fuck it is, he shouted. Just because I'm a goddamn lawyer doesn't mean you can walk around stealing stuff right in front of me. He backed away. What the hell is wrong with you? We'll never beat a rap like this. After much difficulty, we got back to the room and I tried to have a serious talk with Lucy. I felt like a Nazi, but it had to be done. She was not right for us, not in this fragile situation. It was bad enough if she were only what she appeared to be, a strange young girl in the throes of a bad psychotic episode. But what worried me far more than that was the likelihood that she would probably just or be just sane enough in a few hours to work herself into a towering Jesus-based rage at the hazy co- rec- recollection of being picked up and seduced in the Los Angeles International Airport by some kind of cruel Samoan who fed her liquor and LSD, then dragged her to a Vegas hotel room and savagely penetrated every orifice in her body with this throbbing, uncircumcised member. I had a terrible vision of Lucy Lucy crashing into Barbara Streisand's room, or dressing room at the Americana, and laying this brutal story on her. That would finish us. They would track us down and probably castrate us both prior to booking. I explained this to my attorney, who was now in tears at the idea of sending Lucy away. 
She was still powerfully twisted, and I felt the only solution was to get her as far as possible from the flamingo before she got straight enough to remember where she'd been and what had happened to her. Lucy, while we argued, was lying on the patio doing a charcoal sketch of Barbara Streisand from memory this time. It was a full-faced rendering with teeth like, teeth like baseballs and eyes like jellied fire. The sheer intensity of the thing made me nervous. This girl was a walking bomb. God only knows what she might be doing with all those, with all that miswired energy right now. If she didn't have her sketch pad. And what she was going to do when she got straight enough to read The Vegas Visitor, as I just had, and learned that Streisand wasn't due at the Americana for another three weeks. Oof. My attorney finally agreed that Lucy would have to go. The possibility of a man act conviction resulting in disbarment proceedings and a total loss of his livelihood was a key factor in his decision. A nasty federal trap, or nasty federal rap, especially for a monster Samoan facing a typical white middle class jury in Southern California. They might even call it a kidnapping, I said. Straight to the gas chamber, like chessmen. And even if you manage to beat that, they'll send you back to Nevada for rape and consensual sodomy. No, he shouted. I felt sorry for the girl. I wanted to help her. I smiled. That's what Fatty Arbuckle said. And you know what they did to him? Who? Never mind, I said. Just picture yourself telling a jury that you tried to help this poor girl by giving her LSD and by taking her out to Vegas for one of your special stark naked back rubs. He shook his head sadly. You're right. They'd probably burn me at the goddamn stake. Set me on fire right there in the dock. Shit. Doesn't pay to try to help somebody these days. We coax Lucy, Lucy down to the car, telling her that we thought it was about time to go meet Barbara. We had no trouble convincing her that she should take all her artwork, but she couldn't understand why my attorney wanted to bring her suitcase along. I don't want to embarrass her, she protested. She'll think I'm trying to move in with her or something. No, she won't, I said quickly. But that was all I could think of to say. I felt like Martin Borman. What would happen to this poor wretch when we cut her loose? Jail? White slavery? What would Dr. Darwin do under these circumstances? Survival of the fittest? Was that the proper word? Had Darwin ever considered the idea of temporary unfitness, like temporary insanity? Could the doctor have made room in his theory for a thing like LSD? All this was academic, of course. Lucy was a potentially fatal millstone on both our necks. There was absolutely no choice but to cut her adrift and hope her memory was fucked. But some acid vi victims, especially nervous mongoloids, have a strange kind of idiot savant capacity for remembering <laughs> odd details and nothing else. It was possible that Lucy might spend two more days in the grip of, a total, of total amnesia and snap out of it with no memory of anything but our room number at the Flamingo. I thought about this, but the only alternative was to take her out to the desert and feed her remains to the lizards. I wasn't ready for this. It seemed a bit heavy for a thing we were trying to protect, my attorney. It came down to that. So, the problem was to work out a balance, to aim Lucy in a direction that wouldn't snap her mind and provoke a disastrous backlash. She had money. My attorney had ascertained that. At least $200, he'd said. And we can always call the cops up there in Montana where she lives and turn her in. I was reluctant to do this. The only thing worse than turning her loose in Vegas, I felt, was turning her over to the authorities. And that was clearly out of the question anyway. Not now. What kind of goddamn monster are you, I said. First you kidnap the girl, then you rape her, and now you want to have her locked up? He shrugged. It just occurred to me, he said, that, it, or that she has no witnesses. Anything she says about us is completely worthless. Us? I said. He stared at me. I could see that his head was clearing. The acid was almost gone. This meant that Lucy was probably coming down too. It was time to cut the cord. Lucy was waiting for us in the car, listening to the radio with a twisted smile on her face. We were standing about ten yards off. Anybody watching us from a distance might have thought we were some kind of vicious showdown argument about who had rights to the girl. It was a standard scene for a Vegas parking lot. We finally decided to make her a reservation at the Americana. My attorney ambled over to the car and got her last name under some pretense. When I heard her hurried inside and called the hotel saying that I was her uncle and that I wanted her to be treated very gently because she was an artist and might seem a trifle high strung, the room clerk assured me they'd give her every courtesy. Then we drove out of the or out to the airport saying we were going to trade the white whale for a Mercedes 600 and my attorney took her into the lobby with all her gear. She was still unhinged and babbling when he led her away. I drove around a corner and waited for him. Ten minutes later, he shuffled up to the car and got in. Take off slowly, he said. Don't attract any attention. 
When we got out on the Las Vegas Boulevard, he explained that he'd given one of the airport cab hassers a $10 bill to see that, the, that his drunk girlfriend got to the Americana where she had a reservation. I told him to make sure she got there, he said. You think he will? He nodded. The guy said he'd pay the fare with the extra five bucks I gave him and tell the cabbie to humor her. I told him I had some business to take care of, but I'd be there myself in an hour, and if that girl wasn't already checked in, I'd come back here and rip his lungs out. That's good, I said. You can't be subtle in this town. He grinned. As your attorney, I advise you to tell me where you put the goddamn mescaline. <laughs> I pulled over. The kit bag was in the trunk. He fetched out two pellets, and we each ate one. The sun was going down behind the scrub hills northeast of the city. A good Christofferson tune was croaking out of the radio. We cruised back down or back to town through the warm dusk, relaxed on the red leather seats of our electric white Coupe de Ville. Maybe we should take it easy tonight, I said, as we flashed past the Tropicana. Right, he said. Let's find a good seafood restaurant and eat some red salmon. I feel a powerful lust for red salmon. I agreed. But first, we should go back to the hotel and settle in. Maybe have a quick swim and some rum. He nodded, leaning back on the seat and staring up at the sky. Night was coming down slowly. I didn't like that chapter. So, I remember reading it my first time. I think I've actually only read this book once. But, like, I thought about it more and more and more and, like, reread it a couple times. And I don't think he was, like, being serious at all with, I with know, him. I know he wasn't being serious. I think he was just saying that to, sh- like, shock, shock him. him and get him, like, hello, look what, like... This is a serious situation we're in. Mm. Like, I know he wasn't being serious, but, like, I don't know. It just made me very uncomfortable. And I think, like, some, like, he knows the mind of a druggie and, like, he knows best, like, how to get the attention of, a like, somebody in, like, on acid. Mm-hmm. He just wanted to, like, set a bad vibration so that he could get rid of the girl. I get it. Like, I get it. Or he's just, he's honestly just, like, that fucked up and he's, like... I just still didn't like it. It just made me icky. Yeah, but I mean, I guess like luckily for Lucy, it was him because the, another person could have done that. I guess they were at least like nice enough to be like that he like cared about her in some capacity that he was like, get her to her hotel, you know? They, like, told the clerk, like, she's an artist. Be gentle. Yeah. Because they know that she's, like, tripping balls. It's kind of thoughtful, but I'm still, like, really freaked out about all the words that were said in that chapter. All those bad vibrations. (laughs) Which I think, like, the feeling that you feel is exactly, like, his intent for his attorney to feel. So that he would, you know, like, like, yeah, want to, yeah, maybe do right and stop having sex with her and, yeah, like, get rid of her cut the cord Ooh, wow what a chapter that was well that was multiple chapters well that a... that chapter was like fucking hella long yeah <clears throat> i i hate it when they like I, I appreciate long chapters but i hate it when chapters get super inconsistent mm-hmm. in their length because i kind of gauge like how long it took me to read the last chapter so that it, like i like know where i'm at as far as timing goes and then when you get a super long chapter like that, like, I'm like, damn, dude, we, we've been recording for a long time now. Wow. I don't even know what to say about that, except that made me feel gross in my soul. It was a pretty straightforward few chapters. Like, nothing mm-hmm. crazy has really happened except the attorney, like, seduced a woman on the plane at Los Angeles. And she was yeah. a Barbara Streisand, like, she painted Bar- Barbara Streisand portraits. It's like her thing. From Montana, some like she's Midwest probably just, girl, like young, like eighteen. She's tried to run away from home before to see Barbara Streisand, probably religious freak. Bless as, her as heart. It's described in the book. Bless her heart. Bless her little heart. And she's like, I paint portraits of Barbara Streisand. <laughs> and you're like, Yeah, do you? These L L A guys. <laughs> yeah, do you? <laughs> West Coast guys being like, you fucking paint. That's what you do if anybody out there paints portraits of barbara streisand oh, yeah do you? <laughs> do you i was about to say like that's okay but that's kind of weird 
but like, why just Barbra Streisand? But like, like I wouldn't care if it was like celebrities. Be like whatever. But like just Barbra Streisand, like just. Her. Oh, like if you did like multiple celebrities, like if you also painted like Michael Jackson and yeah, if that was just like you did like celebrity like portraits or like whatever. But like just one subject is weird to me. Like why just, are you so yeah. fixated? Like I like to like paint and I'll do art stuff, but like I What's multiple. What's your obsession with Barbara Streisand? Yeah, like why Barbara? You ever see Barbara Streisand's house? <laughs> you know, the whole thing. No. Where she like didn't want a picture of her house to surface on the internet, and they call it the Barbara Streisand effect now, where she didn't want a picture of her house or a video or something to surface on the internet. Like she like very like it was briefly up there and she's like, take that down. I don't want anyone to see that picture. She made such a stink about it that everybody ended up seeing that picture. Like it get, became viral. I know what you're talking about. I remember that. What a good like it's called the Barbara Streisand effect now. I guess it'd be like a good marketing strategy to be like, I don't want this on the Internet. I think that she literally didn't want well, people. No, I mean, not for her. I'm just saying in general for other people doing other things. Yeah, I don't want people to see my YouTube channel or my videos. Take like, it down. Don't look at it. <laughs> don't share it. Reverse psychology. I like how they call it the Barbra Streisand effect, but it's literally just reverse psychology. And it, There's already a term for it, a colloquial, colloquial term for it mm -hmm. called reverse psychology. Like, so it just reminds me of like when you're like little kids – and you like pick on your sibling and they just like the more they tell you to stop the more you want to do it because you're just like getting a rise out of them you know like don't do that and you're like who i just want to get like a rise that out of that, you that yeah i guess it's not reverse psychology but like that you know like stop poking me stop poking me mm -hmm. <laughs> like that already has to have a name it can't be called the barbara streisand effect i don't no, it's I just, always been i just the barbara don't streisand like effect. barbara streisand i really don't like her i don't like, even know what, what Barbara Streisand does. I just don't like her. <laughs> <sighs> like, I'll show you a picture of her and you'll just go, yeah, I don't like her either. I always forget what she looks like for some reason. She's an American singer slash songwriter. Okay. Oh, wait, so I guess she would have been, like, young Barbara Streisand is when she was, like, painting her. Why Why would you even want to paint her? I don't know. Let's listen to a Barbara Streisand song. Oh, no. I've never listened to any of her songs. I'm already bored. <laughs> I'm going to fall asleep. She's like a bad singer. I'm just not into it. I don't know. It's just so like lame. It's too soft. It's soft and like creamy. <laughs> it's like milky. Barbara just, Streisand, soft and creamy. Soft and creamy and <gasps> milky. I just Warm imagine milk. her. I just that's why I just imagine her being like a McPoyle. You. Like her name would actually her name her maiden name was like Barbara McPoyle. Barbara McPoyle. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Comments? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I read this comment. I feel like I just keep looking at it, and so I don't remember. I don't know. Um, okay. My first comment is from Overseer. This story makes me feel high? Question mark, question mark, question You've mark. You've read that comment like four times. Four times? No. <laughs> <laughs> but i feel like every time we read i feel like like afterwards you feel a little like ooh. i feel like lightheaded after we read i don't know what it is it's bizarre like after harry potter i never felt lightheaded after reading but after this book i feel like i feel like fucked up like like when you have like a really really weird day at work where like so much stuff has happened and so many different types of things and yeah. it's just like and you're just like you feel like emotionally exhausted that's what this book makes me feel like. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm a, I'm tired. I need a nap. I was tired going into this, but... <laughs> nap time? Oh, fuck. I'm fucking lit, fam. 
But yeah, this story also makes me feel high, question mark, question mark, question mark. Is this like the stream of consciousness talking about drugs and you're trying... Because like books, <laughs> I feel like invoke the greatest imagination, mm-hmm. right? Like books or words, written words, really help you like paint the picture in your mind. Mm-hmm. And this trying to fucking envision what he is going through, what he is saying, what his words are painting is a mind fuck, I feel like. Maybe that's why it's so like exhausting and I feel like I'm fucking stoned or something. You, I'm just like Are you stoned? Do you feel stoned? <laughs> <laughs> Sod it. Sod it. There's no way you know you guys don't smoke pot. I don't. I know. We talked about this last time. Next comment. Ding. I almost ripped your nose off. How does that feel? Good. That you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> this is all going in. Shut up. <laughs> You can't just act like a crazy person and not expect me to put it I in I can the act video. however I damn well want. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Next comment. Ashley Shepard said, I'm so excited. I can't wait to see Demi's Harry Potter movie reactions. I'm going to change my picture in honor. You'll like it, winky face. Can't wait to see what your picture is. I see it right here. Oh, shit. Mine wasn't popping up because I was, I was like, ooh, I can't wait to see what her picture is going to be. And then... Like, it wasn't showing me on mine. It was showing me the old picture, her old picture. Ooh. So it wasn't showing me the new Snape picture. Yeah. That's cool. I love it. Nice. Um, The fuck are you doing? Next they're comment. Just, they're just fucking messaging Stop so much. looking at it. Next comment is from 17 Eric M. If it was available, I would absolutely love to hear you guys read Hell's Angels book. Sounds super interesting. I'd love to hear your take on it. Keep up the awesome job. Thank you. We'll, thank you. Also. We'll keep, we'll keep that in mind for like another buffer book or yeah, something. Yeah, I think that'd be a good buffer book because I'm like, that's fascinating. Like there's something like intriguing to me about like biker gangs. Especially Hell's Angels. Yeah, like Hell's. like One of the mm. most like notorious biker gangs. And then somebody that lived with them for two years. And his style of journalism, gonzo journalism, that that all does, like, the more I talk about it, the more it seems, like, very interesting. I really want to read that, like, really bad. Ooh. Ooh. So, keep your eyes and ears peeled. Maybe we'll read that soon or what something. What a weird saying. Keep your eyes peeled. Ew, that's kind of gross. Like, when you, like, peel a banana, you're, like, ripping the skin off of it, so it's, like, ripping the skin off your eye. Keep your eye peeled. <coughs> I'm really then when you say keep your ears peeled, I just imagine like Ew. taking the skin off of my ears. <laughs> <laughs> my whole fucking body just like. Keep your body peeled. Ew. Oh, God. Oh, shit. Get oh, up. fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> okay. Next comment. <laughs> Are you drunk? Oh. <laughs> Okay. Next comment. Stop screaming. I'm sorry. Next comment is from Cheryl Shepard. She said, I have no idea of drugs, but in the early 80s, I always remember one of my senseis saying he hadn't had had acid and watched the Battle of Little Bighorn across the sky, and he was scared as he was in amongst the fighting. He also said he had flashbacks, and the road would ripple as he walked down it every now and again. He only tried it once, and he did not enjoy his trip and said that acid crystallizes in your brain. So, once you have used it, there is also the danger that you will get a flashback. Afraid paracetamol is my limit, lol. And then, like, also doesn't LSD stay in your spine or something? Your in spinal your sp- fluid? Yeah. yeah. So, so like, like, if you crack your back, you're, like, at, like, risk, I guess, of, like, having another trip. And, like, nowadays, my back just cracks up when I wake up. Get out of bed. I just imagine all of the things I do and my back just like cracks. And then like, like to I... imagine that if like you had been dropping acid, they like you when you back cracks that you'd be like, uh oh, the road's rippling. Like, whoa, you wake up for work and your back cracks and you're like, I'm running late and I'm going to be tripping balls. <laughs> you're, like, <laughs> you're like running late. Um, I'm not going to be in. Why? I am tripping so hard right now. <laughs> I'm fucking <laughs> tripping balls. Um, yep. 
Is that it? Yeah. Don't make that face at me, little butthole. Ben Harvey said, I'm not sure when telegrams ended, but they were still going strong in the 80s. P.S. I didn't feel that old until you started talking about telegrams, microwaves for mica countertops, like they were delivered in cover wagons by the Pony (laughs) Express. P.P.S. As an Australian, I can explain he or I can explain what he meant. But first, show me your nipples. (laughs) (laughs) Kidding. I can't explain. We're just a pretty weird nation. Yeah. I mean, we did meet another Australian dude, and he was pretty weird too. The Aust- we met a lot of Australians. Actually, we met another Australian dude, and he was pretty weird too. You Australians, you're you're fun. But you're fun. Weird. You're weird. We like had a ten minute conversation <laughs> to an Australian dude about a stiffy, and how like that he doesn't call them boners, or Australians don't call them boners, and like there's he, no other name for it apparently. At le- yeah, at least like what he was saying, like you guys don't really have a bunch of names for like a boner. And it was funny because, you know, he's saying like, oh, like we're asking, like he was drunk and we're asking him like, well, what other names would you call it? And he's like, well, if I was like in a car (laughs) with a girl and like my dick started to get hard, I'd call it a stiffy. I'd be like, oh, I've got a stiffy. And then we're like, yeah, but what other names would you call it? And then finally he like realized what he was at, what we were asking. He's like, well, I sure as hell wouldn't call it a boner. (laughs) This is a funny, funny time. Well. Australians are fun. I want to go to Australia one day. Let's go to Australia. You'd have a blast. Shit. I'd get a stiffy. (laughs) (laughs) Lorette Le Liberty. Did you read a Lorette Le Liberty comment? No. Good. Telegrams were a standard thing at any decent size hotel at the time. Okay. It was something you would send when you needed to get an urgent message to someone. I don't think long distance was really that expensive, but it was kind of a pain to make interstate calls. We didn't have the bulk rates on phone calls. Remember my parents going over the phone bill and every single call in our in our out was listed on the bill, even if it was just to next door. We didn't have any other means of communication, just telegrams, snail mail, and rotary phones and CBs. I remember CBs. My dad had a CB. Because, yeah, my dad had a CB too. Talked to truck drivers. There's a smoky out on... Bingo bongo. Brick brick one nine. Brick brick one nine. I don't know what the rubber fuck ducky. That... <laughs> Go for rubber ducky. <laughs> My mom said that she worked at a restaurant when she was young that had a CB, like where you could like CB in to the restaurant and you could make an order, like a to-go order. And she said that her handle was a fucking corn dog queen. <laughs> corn dog queen. Go for corn dog queen. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Brick Brick One Nine. This corn dog queen. I hope my mom. I need a corn dog. <laughs> I hope my mom's watching. <laughs> I just hope so she can hear us talking about how that she used to be called fun. corn dog queen. That sounds queen. fun though. Yeah. Moms sound like a fun teen. Then her teens. Maybe late teens, early twenties ish. Sound like a fun, fun kid. Fun little kid. Corn dog queen. And then this is absolutely an absolute. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> This is an absolutely no relation to Harry Potter read-alongs or anything, but it is a question I posed to you guys. Uh, somebody posted or commented on my leveling thing that I did, my live stream. Mm-hmm. The w- the one episode I did of a Warg and Drood. Yeah. Basically, it was just like me doing Twitch. Mm-hmm. I haven't done Twitch in forever just because, I don't know. I don't actually have a reason why. But I was wondering... To you guys, if I brought back me doing Twitch, it wouldn't be with Demi. It would be just me. We're also individuals. Because, <laughs> like, I was doing Twitch or YouTube live mm-hmm. gaming, what whichever one. Probably YouTube because I have more invested in YouTube. Mm-hmm. But I do, like, the separation of the two things. But if I did, like, Twitch dead inside or something, like, when I have time, when Demi's not around... Would you guys be interested in watching me play video games and hanging out? It'd probably just be World of Warcraft because World any, of Warcraft. Anytime I have any time to do anything, <laughs> I just play WoW. Anytime so, there's time. It doesn't take a lot of extra for me to just live stream me playing WoW. Mm-hmm. And it'd be cool to like hang out and just bullshit, throw up like Discord or some shit. I don't know. That sounds like fun. I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. <laughs> that's all my comments that's i didn't it? get four i oh only got God, three i don't know i don't know why fool what did i have to bring up i was gonna bring something up 
Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching this video. We appreciate all of your guys' support. And hit that like button or something. <laughs> or something. Do the thing. <laughs> Do all the things. Share with all of your friends what we got cooking in the dead inside kitchen. God, that was lame. <laughs> that was really lame. Fuck. That's the best thing I've ever heard. Can you smell what... Dead's cooking. <laughs> Dead's cooking. Is that copyrighted? Hello! <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anything. We'll see you in the next one. Bye. I, like, have this weird tiredness about me that when I, like, am, like, tired, but I'm not, like, really tired... I'm just like really lame. But then once I get past that point of being like super tired, then it's like I don't give a fuck and I'm really funny. I like when you're like lame and make lame jokes <sighs> though. I think it's 